Movies and video games have enjoyed a long and lasting relationship since the latter rose to prominence in the 1970s and early 80s. Even back then there were plenty of games that were inspired by popular movies. Some were even officially licensed. Can Indiana Jones escape from the forces of evil? Can he survive 13 fiendish situations? But only one became forever tied to the crash of an entire industry. Welcome to Terrible Tie-Ins, where we look at some of the worst things that have ever been adapted to different formats. In this episode, we'll look at some of the attempts to take E.T. off the silver screen and into the pixel realm. Let's just get this over and done with. E.T. on the Atari 2600 is not the worst game ever. It's not even the worst game to feature E.T. But its notoriety will never be forgotten in the gaming industry. Published and developed by Atari in 1982, there are numerous articles surrounding the development, so I'll just give you the TLDR. Atari paid a bucket load of money to Steven Spielberg for the rights to make the game, despite having no idea on even how to make the damn thing to begin with. Howard Scott Warshaw was picked to develop the project after creating the smash hit Yars Revenge and his adaptation of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Unfortunately, due to negotiation delays and a hard deadline, what should have been a 6 to 18 month development cycle was shortened down to just 6 weeks to get the game ready for Christmas. E.T. was in fact one of the highest selling games that year, with a staggering 1.5 million units sold during the Christmas period. What didn't help was that there was allegedly 2.5 to 3.5 million cartridges unsold due to the classic Atari overproduction. Even worse, people were returning the game mostly due to its notorious unplayability. This more than anything led the game to be considered a financial disaster. The result of this, and catastrophes from other areas in the market, led to the infamous crash. And all those unsold cartridges, well, we all know where they landed up. With all that drama aside, let's look at the game. The goal of the game is to find and collect three pieces of a phone so you can Found home. Whilst doing this you need to avoid those pesky adults who either capture you or steal your phone pieces. You have an arbitrary timer slash energy count which goes down when you take damage, use an ability etc. Once you get your phone pieces you'll need to find a spot to call home, go back to where you landed and get picked back up by Willy Wonka's glass elevator. Simple. Unfortunately this game is the pits. Literally. The biggest complaint is that you can't walk around without falling into one of the numerous pits on the screen. When you first fall into one, you're often stuck as the game doesn't give you a clear enough instructions on what to do next. At the top bar you may notice there's occasionally a light blue symbol. This indicates what power you have access to via the joystick button. Not that it tells you what it actually does. So when you're stuck in the pit, you hold down the button until ET's neck gets fully extended. Yes, that's a thing and you simply float out the top, and then 9 times out of 10 immediately fall back in. Once you finally manage to get out of the pit, you can walk around and some different symbols appear at the top. Let's quickly go over all these, shall we? First up is an arrow, which basically allows you to teleport to a corresponding screen based on the direction. This is only useful if you wish to escape the adults, but it's more often easier to just avoid them. The more useful one is the question mark, which when activated should make a little yellow dot briefly appear on screen over a pit. This signifies that the piece of the foam puzzle is down at the bottom of the pit, and yes you have to fall down to retrieve it. Unfortunately this sometimes doesn't work so good luck with that. The egg symbol allows you to eat some Reese's Pieces trademark to retrieve some energy. These are the little black dots that are scattered around the place, so when you collect them, you can get a small tally at the bottom. Occasionally you'll find a place where Vin Diesel is yelling. Activate that, and after a while, Elliot will come and take your pieces away. D don't worry, he's not being a dick. This is how you score in the game. Yes, this game is a point. Or at least points. The more pieces you give Elliot, the more score you get when you finally escape this miserable planet. However, the best thing to do is call Elliot when you have 9 pieces. He turns up, takes your pieces, and buggers off. then returns with a phone piece. Yes, there's a way you can avoid the stupid pitfalls of the game, although this isn't that easy due to the stupid adults. If you manage to find an area with what looks like either a cage or a Roman numeral for three, you can fling the adults away, or at least in theory. 
I didn't find this to be that particularly useful even when they were around. And you could just save yourself the hassle by switching the game to mode 3, which removes the adults entirely. When you finally have all the pieces together, you need to find the flying saucer option. This will phone home and bring your ship back. You then just need to go back to the original screen, look for the square of the cross center, and wait to be picked up when the timer runs out. Yeah, it's actually deceptively simple once you know what you're doing. The problem was that for the longest time, no one actually knew how to play it. There's zero intuition in the game. The symbols are just there with no context, and by most accounts, the instructions weren't any help either. The overly tight hit detection of the pizza allowed for no room for error, and possibly spoiled what playability there is, never mind having to deliberately enter them from time to time. If it wasn't for all the external aspects, this would just have been a mediocre forgettable game. I guess history just won't let this game rest, even when it's literally buried under several thousand tons of other garbage. So enough of that, let's fast forward 20 years to E.T. Interplanetary Mission on the original PlayStation. Published by oh, Ubisoft and New Kid Co. And was developed by Santa Cruz Games, famed developers of Shark's Tale? So this was their first game, and it was so successful they ended up with a career of making ports of other games for the Game Boy and DS. Anyway, this game was released to coincide with the anniversary of the original movie and acts as a sort of sequel. That is, if you don't count the sequel to the novelization written in 1985. Yeah, that's a thing. So apparently on the way back home, E.T. decides to take a detour to do some flower picking. According to the manual, his task is to collect rare and exotic plant specimens with a truly cosmic goal to save the universe. You allegedly travel to beautiful planets, including Green Planet, Ice Planet, Desert Planet, Planet Metropolis, and yes, even Earth. There is a very valid reason I'm only showing footage from the Brown Planet. To help you along the way, you utilize ET's apparent range of superpowers, including telekinesis, healing, heart stun, and running around like you just don't care. On the surface, this game is pretty boring and simple. Underneath the surface, this game is pretty boring and simple. That's pretty much it. You find flowers, heal them, then collect them. Rinse, repeat. You have 99 loft mushrooms, which act as your health. And every time you collect a mushroom, it adds back into it. This tends to do sweet fuck all as every hit takes at least five away. And even when there is plenty around, it's bloody tedious to replenish health points one at a time. Admittedly, one cool effect is that E.T. slowly turns pale as his health declines. Although when he gets knocked down, he gets up again, you're never going to bring him down. Or I should say, he gets back up at full health and then teleports back to the beginning of the level. Why the developers just didn't respawn him at the beginning of the level is beyond me. As the first time you do this, you think, oh cool, I can just go on from nope. I'm guessing it's just to hide away the preloading, kind of like how Tooth Human does it. All snark aside, this game isn't that bad, but two things ultimately kill it. First off, the control direction system is just plain confusing. A fundamentally bad thing to screw up in a game. Basically, the game is set up in an isometric fashion, also known as that 60 degree angle view as popularized by games like Diablo. But the joypad is coded to move on an angle relative to the screen. So up on the joypad is up left, down is down right, etc, etc, etc. This wouldn't be an issue, but you can move up, down, left, right on the screen itself, making this both pointless and utterly confusing. The next issue is the game's save function system, which seems necessary because you get fatigued from playing it more than 10 minutes and may want to keep your progress for some reason. After several levels of barely any challenge beyond some basic puzzles, you finally start to meet enemies that just kick the ever-living shit out of you. Often you make it through a level with only the barest of life left, but you feel safe knowing that your safe state can keep you going through the rest of the levels. That is until you remember that this is a poorly designed game that doesn't want you to continue easily. Whilst it saves your progress at the end of the level, it also saves your health and lives. And because of this, there is no continues. You just restart at your last save point. 
This is obviously fantastic when you have no extra lives left and less than half health. That means you're supposed to continue the rest of the game with only that. So this is the point where you think, fuck it, I'm gonna cheat. Only to find out there's only game shark codes, which is completely useless if you don't actually own one. So this is the reason I didn't show you the rest of the game. I gave up after five levels of utter boredom and a difficulty ramp designed to drain your life, patience, and sanity. Overall, I don't hate this game. I've played a ton worse adaptations. And what's worse is that this isn't even the worst ET game ever. Oh boy, I, I don't want to do this one. It hurt me enough the first time I played it all those years ago. It hurts me enough to play it now. What's worse is that my video footage got balked, so I had to play this again for this review. So you better fucking like, share, and subscribe for my pain. This piece of excrement makes the Atari game look like something made by Bioware. Well, before they got screwed over by EA. This thing doesn't even deserve the dignity of the term game. And it's quite possibly the worst thing to have ever sold the good name of the Nintendo GameCube. And that had an Aquaman game. This is the horror that is Universal Studios' theme park adventure. The game was developed by Kemco, known purveyor of cheap tie-ins, and developed by Naya Digital Works. Don't worry if you've never heard of them, as this appears to be the only game they've ever developed. So upon loading this game, you're triggered to a notice that states that this game is not a true representation of Universal Studios TM theme parks, but an interactive game based on Universal Studios TM theme parks, and some of the characters featured are not associated with the park. So why the hell have them here? To be brutally honest, this is the best part of the game. Seriously. They likely wanted to disassociate with this mess, but clearly needed to state that this just doesn't reflect the actual experience of the parks themselves. <sighs> Back to the game. First off, you're treated to an intro, which would have been perfectly serviceable in 1995, but this was released in 2001. Well, wait, 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 wait. This came out a whole year before the PlayStation game. The PlayStation ET game was on the previous generation, but at this stage, the PS2 and GameCube were already... What the fuck is wrong with you, ET? Ugh, okay, okay. So you start me up and choose a name. Numpty seems appropriate. You then choose an avatar from this collection of 90 stereotypes, including the token, the Asian, and possibly the girl. I went with the kid with the bucket on his head. I could go back and call him Buckethead, but that would require caring. You endure a bunch of utterly boring text dumps that you really should have been given throughout normal play as you explore. Well, that is if this was a normal game. Sadly, these are delivered by the formerly great cartoon character Woody Woodpecker, who is clearly paying off a debt to society by appearing in this dumpster fire. After all that, you find yourself running around between screens with rapidly changing angles and directions, making navigation utterly confusing. So what you really need is a map. You find someone that looks like a park employee with blue and white overalls with a red exclamation question mark over their head, and they prove to be utterly pointless. Instinct would tell you that a map vendor would be near the entrance, but after spending eternity running around trying to find something to interact with, you finally hit fuck it and continue through the park. Eventually you find some random yellow dude with a, that red exclamation mark, and he'll ask, did you get a map? With the answer being, obviously no. And then he responds with, if you don't get a map, get one back at the park entrance. But, but, but I, but, uh, you go back to the entrance, and still can't find any bastard you haven't already talked to. Frustrated, you go back through the park, and then another assumed park attendee in red and white says, Someone was handing out maps at the park entrance. Getting beyond a fucking joke at this point, you go back, and the useless blue and white guy at the front finally gives you a damn map. Huzzah, you completed the game. Now switch it off and never play this again. Okay, okay, I know what I must do. <sighs> We never find out why this sadistic asshat just didn't give you the fucking map in the first place, but I digress. So the map is essential, not because she tells you how to get to the area you need to go, but because it makes navigating this utterly terrible environment barely tolerable. Okay, okay, let's say you need to go north according to the map. Well, you figure going in that direction intuitive to your location might be the way to... No. 
even going left or right on your screen is in fact a completely different direction because even basic geography is too hard for these developers. Never mind that there are open areas that look like access ways to other parts of the map only to find that they're the staple of terrible game design, invisible walls. Let's just skip most of this bullshit and just get to the fucking EP part of this misery. So this is our main event. It's a simple side scroller where you ride your bike to the shuttle to send ET home. Your main enemy is the 5 minute time limit and all the rest of the obstacles in your way. Occasionally there are some boulders you need to dodge which don't do any damage if you get hit and occasionally the land may fall out from underneath. These are often easily avoidable unless you really screw up and yet that doesn't seem to matter that much. You have booster pads along the way to help you jump over obstacles, but if you stick the landing, you'll just lose even more time than if you just avoided the damn thing. And that's really it. After you reach a certain point, you float into the distance, hopefully away from this game forever. just to land back down in night time. This is essentially exactly like the earlier part, just with poor visibility, and it looks like a sewage outlet was poured onto the screen. I like other games of this style where you're changing lanes with a controller. This one you're steering with a controller, and it just feels a little bit counterintuitive. As you push up and down to move, you kind of feel like you should be moving left and right. And of course, this gets into much difficulty when you're using left and right to try and bounce over a jump. Even the 5 minute timer just never feels like it's short enough to give you a challenge, as even consistently fucking up never feels like you're losing too much time. But don't worry, all the previous people before you took almost an hour to complete it. I kid you not. If you suddenly lose brain cells and want to replay it again, unfortunately you have to wait for the line to clear up. This is actually quite possibly the most accurate part of the experience, the never ending fucking lines. I guess you got one part right game. Although, if other people were taking an hour to complete this, it would explain a few things. This game is an absolute waste of time, money, and life. Don't even bother getting it for shits and giggles, because you're guaranteed to not get the giggles. And that was going to be it for this trip into E.T.'s Gaming Pass. But then I happened across something that I just couldn't pass up. E.T. on the Game Boy Advance. Not surprisingly, there is very little information about this game beyond some quite useless reviews on Metacritic and a bunch of YouTube videos I didn't bother watching. This game was once again published by New Kidco, who also unleashed a ton of E.T. pack around about the same time, but this game was developed by Fluid Studios. Not to be confused with Fluid Entertainment, who also released a bunch of other tie-in crap. There really isn't that much out there on Fluid Studios themselves. But strangely enough, the only things I could find is that they developed a GBA port of an Army Man spin-off, plus they made a Top Gun game that was published by... Oh. Oh, oh, oh no. We'll get to you one day. So E.T. on the GBA was released a few months earlier than Interplanetary Mission on December 14th, 2001, just in time for Christmas. Well, that's always worked in the past. This game is broken up into 10 stages that follow the rough plot of the movie. You start off as E.T. dropped by a ship to go flower picking, and we're already starting to get into trouble with this game. Seriously, what kind of botanist needs to pick 15 of the exact same flower, and why the hell are they spread out so far? This game honestly wouldn't be so bad, but the controls are just horrible. It has that speed down, slow up effect that occurs when you push a button in a direction. Think Super Mario Bros., but 100 times worse. The biggest problem is how unresponsive the controls feel, so you end up crashing into almost everything, and actually everything hurts you except the trees. The trees are just hurt by your elitist botanist snobbery. Don't worry if you hit an enemy, which is practically every living thing, because they'll survive the encounter better than you will. After you hit them, they'll flash to tell you that you can't get hurt from them, in typical gaming style. This also happens to be just long enough for you to pick up enough momentum to run back into them and take damage again. Eventually you get your 15 plans and blindly figure out your way back to the ship, which then gets spooked, and like in the movie, it buckers off without you. After being callously abandoned by your own people, stage 2 involves running around the forest looking for an escape. 
the part is not only ridiculously long and time consuming, but the music is so utterly unbearable. Although at least it helps cover up the terrible sound effects. So quickly touching on the hell system, up in the top right corner is E.T.'s deformed cousin, T.E., who spins around like a record every time he gets hit. Eventually with enough damage taken, the top corner starts filling up with T.E.'s blood, and E.T. starts to go pale. I wonder if Interplanetary Mission ripped that one off. Anyway, the stage got so long, tedious and boring that any goodwill I had to this game evaporated a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. The good news is that we got an ET with an inbuilt password system, so we can at least skip to the next level. Oh, and because this game couldn't get any better, it completely crashed on me. Come here. Hey, you, stop. Freeze. Yeah, yo. Seriously, the cart itself died, and several attempts to play certain stages couldn't happen. Unfortunately, I'm missing footage from some of the test runs I did whilst I was troubleshooting this issue and got the cart semi-functional again. But frankly, you're not missing out on much. Stages 3 and 8 are Elliot running around a house that looks like he lives outdoors. Hang on, are those flowers in his living room floor? Yeah, it's another run around and find crap stage that's utterly tedious. But the bad guy catch animation is at least entertaining. <laughs> stages 4 and 9 are Elliot riding his bike with controls that would be slightly less terrible in the Universal game. And that's saying something. However, there is more stuff to do than just going right, so it's a better game for it. But you don't get much better freedom of movement as long as you don't want to go on the fucking footpath. The jumps, on the other hand, are a joke. Mostly because you're constantly pushing A to pedal, and you never gain enough momentum to clear anything. Apparently E.T. is supposed to levitate you, but as this uses health power, it's usually not worth it. But as this is often the only way to get delicious health candy, it's a pain in the ass. Never mind that apparently gravity makes any jump you take drag you immediately towards the bottom of the screen. Which makes absolutely perfect sense considering the perspective. I'm guessing Henry Thomas didn't give his lightness right, so they just replaced him with burnt crayon. Finally, there are two mini games to break up the tedium. And when I say break up the tedium, I mean add to the tedium in new and inventive ways. First is an utterly perplexing puzzle that requires you to place junk in a specific order to create the signaling device. There's a woefully short time limit and no real indication on how to do it properly. Oh, and the controls are complete crap too. I have no footage, so just take my word for it. This game has quite possibly one of the stupidest final levels in gaming history. I mean, it's basically a Lunar Lander game, but she has to be so damn specific in movement and speed that if you miss... Yeah, there is really no forgiveness in this, but it's not exactly hard. If anything, the timer just gives you the illusion of urgency. So now we've gone over the games, let's see how well they relate to the source material. Let's start off by stating that this is one of those franchises that is often difficult to convert into this sort of medium. E.T. itself is for the most part a very passive character, which is mostly hard to translate into someone the player needs to control. I don't necessarily mean that all POV characters need to be violent or action orientated, but there is a certain disconnect when even the slightest thing in these games harm or hinder you with no real good way to counter it. This becomes even worse when the game itself mechanically punishes you for using an ability to avoid such things. All that being said, let's look at the games themselves and how they stack up. E.T. on the Atari has a reputation that scars most of the game's actual representation, but overall it's a fairly accurate to the basic idea of the movie's plot. It's mostly hampered by a rush schedule leading to a poor development, and an industry on the tipping point of collapse anyway. That's not to say that given the few extra months would have made this game great, but if it had some time to play test it, and the issues that play the game could have been potentially fixed at least tries to tell a truncated version of the movie, well as much as you could squeezed into something like an Atari 2600 card. For the most part it's got your recognisable elements. E.T. trying to get home, Elliot helping E.T., 
the government trying to capture ET and the important Reese's Pieces TN. Alternatively, ET Interplanetary Mission tries to substitute itself as a spiritual successor to the film. Sadly, it's just an uninspired game with no real ties to the themes of the original product, and you could just replace E.T. with literally any other things and it would still function the same. It didn't help that it was developed for a console in its literal dying years, despite the PlayStation 2 being around for two years at that time. I doubt any particular effort was made into this offering as the publisher was well known for pushing out cheap, tying garbage to soak in those nostalgia bucks. Speaking of no particular effort, Universal Studios' theme park adventure is by far one of the worst games I've ever played, and definitely one of the worst games to sell the reputation of the Nintendo GameCube. It's absurd that this managed to not only get released in a state that it's in, but it somehow managed to get through Nintendo's own notorious standards and even got a seal of approval. It could be forgiven for not truly trying to be based on the movie itself, but even that part of the game is just uninspired and lazy. By comparison, the Game Boy Advance game is Skyrim, and is just as buggy. It at least attempts to follow the narrative of the movie. That's the only game listed here where you play as Elliot, at least when he's not on a bike. The padding and level design is ultimately what kills any enjoyment for me. Being fair though, handheld games of this era are not meant to be grand narratives that we would have even expected of consoles of the time. It's quite possible that a game like this could have occupied the kids on a particularly long drive somewhere. However, a good game it is not. I might be willing to call it a noble effort for such a cheap game, but ultimately that's also giving it way too much credit. So yeah, it turns out that E.T. on the Atari is not only not the worst game ever made, it's not even close to the worst game about the character. And on that bombshell, please click like, share and subscribe, and please comment with your own horrible experiences with these games or suggestions for future terrible tie-ins.